This is our last panel that I'm introducing, and I, I'm really excited about this one. It's, it's about the importance of democratizing innovation and really including participatory research uh, from the very beginning, talking to farmers, asking communities what they, they need rather than telling them what they want. Our, uh, I, I'd like to thank, again, the McKnight Foundation for support supporting Food Tank's work on this project. It's a new one for us. We're just delving into it, so I'm very excited to hear our panelists talk about it. Our keynote for this panel is John Fisk, the director of Winrock International's Wallace Center. His work focuses on helping communities support the creation of food and farming enterprises that provide healthy food grown in a sustainable manner, while also providing a fair return for farmers. I'm really thrilled he can join us today. And our moderator is also someone I really admire, uh, Tim Carbon of the Washington Post. Tim covers food full time for the Post food section and is a restaurant reviewer for the Sunday edition, requiring, according to his biography, that he ingests more calories than a horse, which makes me really jealous. Um, so I'm also really excited he can be here. And I want to welcome our moderator and our keynote to the stage, as well as our panelists. Thank you. All right, maybe I'll get started while they're, they're getting settled in. It's great to be with you. It's really exciting to know that uh, this is being streamed through houses and offices across the country and even the globe, I imagine. And it's nice to see some familiar faces out there as well. You know, after two days of the Food Tank Summit, do you get the feeling that we're onto something? You know, you get the feeling maybe the winds are changing a little bit. I think it's exciting. To me, there's a feeling that more and more people are lifting their heads and seeing that a good food system one that offers, offers healthy food, fair food, sustainably grown food to their communities and their kids is what they want. Yesterday at the closing of the day, Michelle Nishan put his finger on it for me. He said, it's going to be a food movement to be reckoned with. And that's where we're at. Indeed, there's an evolution going on here, right? I didn't say revolution, I said evolution. Now, why did I say that? Because I believe this is the natural course of things. We tried feeding ourselves from the factory farm. We tried feeding ourselves from the factory food system, and what did we get? I think you all know, we got diabetes, obesity, dead zones in the Gulf, antibiotic resistance, fast food chains, and so on. Driving out independently owned and family run businesses from our communities. We got the lowest common denominator, and we called it food, and we called it progress. But because of people like you and many farmers and advocates and businesses across the, the country, we're changing course. There's a change in the winds. We have over 8,000 farmers markets, farm to school procurement in 44% of our public schools impacting over 23 million children. We have food stamps in farmers markets. Who would have thunk? Over 300 food hubs working with over 12,000 family farms across the country. We have support from USDA and we have support from land grants across the country. By the best estimate, local food sales are over $9 billion annually. Our food system is evolving. And at the root of that food system, at the root of innovation, evolution, is innovation at every stage from farm to fork. And thinking about the title of this session, democratizing anything to me suggests self-determination. It suggests that if we transfer our responsibility to the few or the powerful, the result may not meet our needs. Democratizing innovation in food means we don't leave innovation to those that have been anointed as the innovators. It means that our communities and our regions take back some of that responsibility so that the food system does meet our needs, so that there's healthy food on our plates, fair and equitable supply chains, community and economic development, access to good food for all, and stewardship of the environment. It means we can all be innovators. And as a movement, we need to share these innovations so that others can use and adapt them. So where are we going? Where are we evolving to? And what can we do about it to keep it moving? Much of the growth that we've seen in healthy food systems has been the result of localized efforts 
out of the grassroots, where, through innovation, people are forging new value chains. Innovation and creativity are essential, and sharing innovation in an open way is critical. But just as critical is the financial literacy and the business discipline it takes to build and grow social enterprises. $9 billion sounds like a lot, but it's just a small fraction of the $1.4 trillion food system. We have a long way to go to reach a scale where we're really a significant component of that system. But the phone is ringing, right? The phone's ringing. And on the other end are the retail chains, the restaurant chains, the food service companies, school districts. Things are really ready to explode here. Companies that make up much of that $1.4 trillion want to work with us. So what? So we need to scale out and we need to scale up so that we become much more a part of this landscape. But let's be very clear that the purpose of scaling, the purpose of scaling is not just to get bigger and get more market share. That's the old model. The purpose for scaling for us is to have more impact. It's a strategy so that more farmers, more communities, and more acres benefit and have more self-determination in how they feed themselves. To me, scaling out is replicating and adapting many of the direct market innovations that work, like food boxes, farmers markets, CSA, restaurants owning farms, and much more. There's hundreds of innovations. Making these more permanent and everyday parts of our lives is scaling out. Scaling up is going to mean growing the size of these food businesses and the number of the businesses so that they can benefit from some of the economic and logistical efficiencies that come with size. As these enterprises grow and engage with the dominant system, the challenge we face is to keep our values. The values of healthy, fair, green, and affordable, keeping it front and center and build them into the business plans. That's what a social enterprise is, is it builds values into the business plans of the businesses that are going to emerge and are going to scale this thing. In other words, we want to work with the conventional system, but we want to do it on our own terms. The part of the journey that we're in, in the evolution, is discovering what those terms are and how our values translate into business practices and how they operationalize into the new scaled context. This is and will remain a significant challenge for quite a while. But to do this, we need to support the development of businesses innovative social enterprises that produce, distribute, sell, and prepare the food that we eat. We need to actively support their development. At the Wallace Center at Winrock, we focus a lot on regional food hubs as a strategy to do this. We think it'll help increase the supply of good food while having a social impact we want and generate revenue that allows this approach to continue and expand. A regional food hub is a business that actively manages some of the core functions in the supply chain. Aggregation, distribution, and marketing of source identified food products, primarily from local and regional producers into wholesale markets. The difference between a food hub and the conventional food distributor are the values that underpin its very existence. Food hubs are committed to buying from small and mid-sized local producers. They ensure that producers get a fair price for their products. They work closely with those producers to build the capacity so they can be an effective part of the supply chain and meet buyer requirements. They work with buyers on the other end, right, to help them adjust their systems to accommodate regional sourcing versus global sourcing, which is what they're really set up for. Many are committed to addressing food access inequities. In fact, 60% have a mission focused on improving human health. Most are expanding markets for sustainably produced products. And regional food hubs are working closely with health, healthy food system organizations and advocates. And they play a role, an active role, in that change-making process. So as we scale up the business of good food, be it food hubs or other models, we need to be vigilant that we keep these values connected to the operations, embedded in the business, and make choices that reflect those values, such as who owns the business, who benefits from the business. What are the production and labor standards in that value chain? Who do they buy from? Who do they sell from? And under what conditions do they do these things? These, these are the embedding of the values in the operation and in the, and in the engagement with the conventional system. At the Wallace Center, we're in the business of spreading innovation and helping to appropriately scale good food systems. We do this in a number of ways. First, we create a space for spreading innovation. 
The National Good Food Network is a community of practice that connects these businesses and others to foster peer-to-peer -peer learning and support this evolution. We build, a capacity, we build the capacity of people to adopt and adapt these innovations. We provide technical assistance in many ways. We have a successful webinar series that features innovations from across the country, talking about the nuts and bolts of the operations of hubs and other enterprises. We identify and address key challenges in scale, and we seek solution. For example, compliance with food safety regulation. We're working hand in hand with USDA to develop a group gap approach to food safety certification that should cut the time and the cost to small and mid-sized farms and reduce barriers to ending wholesale markets. And we track changes in the sector and we do research that the broader group of stakeholders, those that aren't on the front lines, need to have in order to understand these innovations and get on board. For example, with Michigan State University, we do a national survey of food hubs that helps us understand the various approaches that they take, the impacts and the challenges. With Farm Credit East, we're doing a financial benchmarking study that helps understand where hubs and others can improve and be more efficient. A healthy, good food system is an idea whose time has come. At the Wallace Center, we're going to continue to cultivate, nurture, and spread innovation in order to see this system scale out and scale up in a way that serves all of our values. You've heard the familiar quote from Buckminster Fuller, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. To me, this sounds exactly like what we're all doing together. It's been good to be with you today. Thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, and thanks for coming to the last one of the conference. Uh, so we, uh, kind of to, to riff on John's um, keynote address, we are going to talk about um, innovations and how you scale them up. Uh, the, the panel is called, as you know, Democratizing Innovation. And I think we all kind of struggled a little bit with what that term means. But uh, we're looking at it, I think, generally not just like open source code, where you know, someone creates a, uh, an idea and then shares it with anyone who wants to expand on it. But as in, we have a panel full of innovators here. And how can you scale that up and bring it to a much larger group and change the system, as John said? So we do have a great panel of innovators here, and I want to introduce them. To, from my far left, we've got Shen Tong, who is the founder of FoodX. Next to Shen is uh, Steve Brescia, who is the executive director of Groundswell International. Uh, next to him is Aaron McNevin, who's the director of aquaculture at World Wildlife Fund. Uh, next to him is Jessica Rosen, the Senior Sustainability Advisor for Forum for the Future. And two to my left is uh, Doug Hertzler, and Doug is a, a fill-in for Katie Campbell, who couldn't make it today. And to my immediate left is uh, Jill Eisenbarger, from, uh, the Executive Director of Stone Barn Center for Food and a uh, Agriculture. Um, so let's just start right away, like this idea of like innovation scaling up and working within the existing system. All of these things seem difficult to put a fine point on it. Like uh, Steve, I know you have, you have been working in aquaculture and Jessica as well. And this idea of like working within the existing system to bring innovation to maybe a system that is not open to it. Explain, like, I, I know you've been working with Velasso and at Salmon Farms. It's like, can you give a little bit of hint of what's been going on with that? That's, he's the yeah. salmon. I'm happy to talk about my work. Uh, okay. Start with that. <laughs> my bad. That's all right. Well, so for World Wildlife Fund, we're really interested in, in trying to identify the key impacts and, and really minimize those key impacts. So we're talking about not a particular system type, but rather innovating around uh, the idea of actually democratizing innovation. So <clears throat> what we feel is the most important is to focus on the major impacts 
quantify them, and then set targets against those performance, uh, performance limits and let, uh, let producers and innovators move to those levels and get beyond them. And one of the key aspects was a, 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 far, a farm started by DuPont Chemical uh, called Verlasso Salmon. And what they did was they took an issue that's really dear to the environmentalist heart, which is the, the, the use of wild fish in feeds, um, and they sidestepped it with uh, a protein alternative and reduced the demand of wild fish for their salmon by 75%. And of course, it's proprietary. Right, so how do you take that? Like, how do you take this innovation and convince a company to share it? Is there a way to do that? I think the, I think the incentives are, 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 are very different for say company versus what we'd think as far as somebody that provides research for the public. Somebody that provides research for the public would be something more along the lines of uh, research institutions, government institutions, universities. I think that the incentive to conduct research uh, to develop these innovative solutions for private companies is money and, and profits. And I think we need to accept that. But, I, but, but we also need to recognize those companies because there are other companies out there doing it. There's, three other companies trialing this stuff, and there's a group called Aquasparks that's funding two of them right now. So I think that when people see that there's a competitive advantage for certain aspects, then other companies will start to move towards that direction. But I think we, we need to be truthful with ourselves about what this uh, capitalistic environment really is. Steve, I'm sorry, you, you were, you're working in Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, you've got an agroecology uh, program working with farmers and trying to get them to look at farming systems a different way. How do you, how do you compete in teaching sort of like agroecology methods versus the big seed companies and the other ones that have all the power and the money? Yeah, well, let me give you an example of that. Um, and I enjoyed the, I really appreciated the last comment by the opening speaker on uh, needing to create an alternative you know, system that, and I think it's really about how do we transition to that. And there's a lot of documentation and research out there about the need to do that. So we see these, we've heard a lot about these uh, 2.5 billion family farmers, people involved in family farming around the world. We see them as real innovators and, and how can uh, they be empowered to generate the solutions to a lot of the problems that the world is, is facing, including their own challenges with hunger and, and climate change, et cetera. So um, Groundswell works in eight countries in Africa and Latin America and Asia. And just to give an example of what it means when we think of democratizing innovation, I'll just take a specific example of a, of a woman named Damata from uh, Burkina Faso, Eastern Burkina Faso. And um, she, like a lot of people across the Sahel in Africa, uh, is facing a severe soil fertility crisis uh, on, her, on her farm, having trouble you know, producing enough food for her farm, can't generate income to send her children to school, is having to s strip her assets and sell animals and things like this, and becoming more and more vulnerable if, if they're hit with you know, harder shocks. So the reason for that is, is something that's really common across uh, the Sahel in Africa is that in the past, people used to um, fallow their land. They used to um, leave their land for 10 to 20 years and, and move on, and then they would cut new land. They would clear the trees, burn them, burn them off, and then come back to that land after 10 to 20 years, after producing in the, the cleared land for a few years, and it was restored, the soil was uh, restored you know, through, through the natural fallowing processes. But as, as population pressures of people and animals have increased, it hasn't been possible and people are staying on the same land, and then you have climate change, and, and farmers need to, like Damata, need to produce more on the same land uh, with you know, increasing pressure on it. So this is, this is leading to this you know, situation of soil fertility and hunger crisis across, across the Sahel. So working with her and other farmers, we set up a program of, uh, we work on uh, farmer innovation and scaling agroecological testing and ex scaling agroecological farming practices and spreading those farmer to farmer, and then also connecting to uh, trying to create more enabling policies and local markets. So specifically with, uh, we organized a series of villages there and Damata was uh, one of the people involved with that and was selected by our community to be involved in this farmer experimentation process, testing ways they could improve their soil fertility and overcome this crisis. And uh, there are practices that work, that's the good news, and the question is how do we scale them and why aren't they scaling? And so one of those practices which the farmers tested is called zai holes, which are like 
small catchment <coughs> basins that the farmers dig into their land about you know, a meter around and a foot or so deep and putting some compost into them and planting in them. So when the rains come, you have hard pan soils, which are like this stage, you know, and they just run off. But when the rains come, they catch like four or five times the amount of rain and allow production to increase and the soil fertility to, to come back. So in the first year, Damato saw that her, in, her, in, her production was increasing about 75%. And then other neighbors noticed that. And you know, other, other farmers are also experimenting the same way. And they begin to share these practices, you know, farmer to farmer. And, um, and then a second part of the process was connecting them to this really exciting uh, movement of regreening the Sahel, which is there's some really, uh, as I said, exciting practices around, even though farmers have been clearing their land of trees, there's, they, farmers and, and NGOs and scientists, uh, people have noticed that there's a living forest of the stumps and the roots under the land. So how about dialoguing with farmers about letting those trees regenerate on the farms and seeing which ones are good for restoring organic matter or uh, you know, fixed nitrogen or fodder for animals or firewood. And so we organized a cross visit to another uh, set of villages that have achieved this and really changed their landscape and, and helped to re-green things and with these community groups that, of which Damata is a part of. And now they've come back and they have, you know, beginning to do this on their own land. And this is, this is a innovation, which is, is uh, I think, very democratic and is, and is expanding at scale. I mean, you can even see satellite photos, you know, across parts of the Sahel with uh, increased tree cover and uh, leading to all these benefits, including increased, you know, food production. So now last part of it is trying to get these organized groups to be in dialogue with their, for example, their government uh, officials, local district planning processes on food security so that they can say, for example, you know, instead of investing 50% of our Ministry of Agriculture budget in chemical fertilizers, why not support these processes that work and scale them? So there's a number of steps involved, but there's, we see tremendous hope and potential working with farmers in that way. Are governments responsive? They can be, and we are working in this program. I mentioned directly with uh, INERA is the research agency, the research arm of the Ministry of Agriculture in, in Burkina Faso. And they're a part of this process with us. So that's, that's part of it is to, you know, we can't do it in isolation, is to, you know, build understanding with them and build collaboration with them. So they've been, yeah, collaborators in this process. Well, but, see, I think what's, what, you know, for a, essentially an outsider like me, you know, listening to your story, it's like why everything that you argue about, increased yields, uh, uh, soil fertility, increased soil fertility, um, you know, feeding hungry populations. All these just seem like no-brainers. Where would the resistance to try to spreading this come from? Well, it doesn't, the approach I'm describing, the agroecological approach, doesn't open up markets, you know, for, for chemical fertilizers or, or external seeds or pesticides. So there's a lack of interest uh, for those who are interested in those opportunities. And in low-income countries like Burkina Faso, sometimes the research ministry, their, part of their budget is paid for by external grants and you know, development agencies who perhaps want to introduce some of those practices. So you do have you know, major you know, corporate interests also influencing as well. And I think it's just, it's part of this whole just change process of, of creating a tipping, point, tipping points and seeing that this is a viable alternative and why, yeah, why not scale it and spread it um, and, and just kind of a paradigm shift as well for opening up, you know, how, how agronomists and people in ag ministries, et cetera, have been trained over the years is not necessarily in line with what I'm describing. Well, I think, uh, Doug, you can kind of maybe riff on this. I know you were working with uh, something you were telling me about called the, the G8 New Alliance and how they've kind of kept small farmers out of the decision-making process. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you a little bit first about, uh, about what Katie Campbell might have said if she, if she was here, because I know Katie very much wanted to be here and, and can't be, and I hope she's watching on the live stream. We'll send some positive thoughts your way. Um, but, but Katie works for a project we call the Public Financing for Agriculture Project. Um, Action Aid is present in, in 45 countries in both the uh, northern and southern hemispheres. And we're a human rights organization working on the right to food and women's and, and children's rights. Uh, the Public Financing for Agriculture Project uh, gets women farmers to look at their national agricultural budgets. And uh, it's working with groups of actually thousands of these farmers in four countries to go to their governments and, and ask for more public financing for things like agroecology and things like basic rural 
rural infrastructure. African governments have actually already pledged to do this. They pledged to raise their spending on rural areas and on agriculture by 10%, and up to 10% of their budgets, and they pledged that in, in um, 2003, and they've recommitted to it in 2014, but it, it hasn't happened yet in most countries. Uh, and, and as we know, that's a key, and it's been very, very good in parts of, of uh, Asia in, in really addressing hunger. Um, on the negative side of that, so we can get you know, women in, involved in speaking to, to government, um, some of the international development processes are going in the opposite direction. So we've got the G8 um, New Alliance, which was set up by the G8 during Obama's uh, presidency of the G8 in 2012. And uh, through 2012, 2013, they negotiated with 10 African countries, G8 governments and, and African governments and private sector um, investors to uh, make policy changes that, to African governments agree to policy changes that would, would bring in more private sector investment. And this involves changing seed laws, and this involves in making land uh, available to investors. So for example, in, in Tanzania, the Tanzania government currently plans to, uh, to set up 25 large-scale farms. And on average, each of these farms is the size of the city of Washington, DC. Um, and this is supposed to you know, trickle down to benefits to, to smallholders in some way. But smallholders haven't been a part of this process at all. And so um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to bring smallholders. And they have organizations, bring their organizations into the international development dialogue. Jessica, you kind of involved in similar uh, areas in Africa, is that right? Um, we work really globally, um, mm -hmm. and I think that a lot of our um, partnerships, so Forum takes a different perspective, I think, from some of the other panelists in that we treat democratizing innovation at the system level. So how do we shift the system? And our approach is working um, mainly with business, um, with a lot of the manufacturers and retailers and restaurants and food service and even agribusiness on working on their internal sustainability as well as partnering within their industry and with other stakeholders along their um, supply chains and with their consumers. And so our mission is really to an accelerate a transition towards the sustainable future. And we've heard lots of speakers talking about how we have some really big problems and really big challenges and we really need to accelerate that change because we're not going to have three planets available by 2050. I think Luca mentioned that earlier. And so we see that the scale at which some of these companies operate um, as an avenue to create some really massive change. And so um, Unilever, for example, is the world's biggest purchaser of palm oil. And I think it's currently 60% of their palm oil is sourced sustainably. And they're on track to have 100% sustainably sourced by 2020. And I, at the end of 2014, 96% of the world's palm oil was sourced sustainably. And that was due in part to a really big player having a really big influence over the rest of the industry. Um, and Forum for the Future works on democratizing innovation in food by bringing a lot of these stakeholders together to um, our mission in food is, is around the three R's conveniently called. So um, reconnecting people with their food and rethinking value in the system and restoring resilience in the system. And we do that through transforming food culture by reducing food and packaging waste and work on sustainable diets. Um, we do that through maximizing nutritional outcomes by improving food security, but also reducing environmental impacts. And finally, this concept of sustainable value networks, which I think is most applicable to democratizing innovation because it's changing the traditional um, lens of linear supply and value chains to networks. The world is about networks and relationships and two-way information sharing and not just take, make, use, and waste um, our food. And so looking at things as a network, I think, has a tremendous potential to um, really democratize innovation in the food system. And we've demonstrated this through a project in the tea sector called Tea 2030 that is about creating a sustainable future for tea. And we brought together the biggest tea buyers, producers, um, certifiers like the Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade. So everybody is involved. And tea is produced in a lot of um, developing countries, Kenya, India, Indonesia. So the producers are a really important part of that value network. 
and those big stakeholders came together to identify what the challenges were for the future of tea in the future and what innovations and collaborations they could form to create a more sustainable future. And those three platforms were looking at market mechanisms and um, sustainable landscapes, which is being um, led by the Rainforest Alliance. The Unilever is leading the market mechanisms bit and then also addressing consumers. And some of the principles we identified of a sustainable value network include more connected consumers and really empowering producers. So that's how we think about democratizing innovation um, within the food system, is really thinking of it as, as a value network for all of the stakeholders involved, and not just in Africa, but um, around the world. So let me go back to Unilever. Like, they're big enough they could probably just do whatever they want. Like, how do you, how do you convince a company that big to, you know what, let's spend a few pennies more to do sustainable palm oil? So there is a strong business case for these companies. We've heard about how consumers have become much more demanding and much more aware of their food. So the companies are responding to consumer demands, to NGO demands, but there's also a business case in terms of making more sustainable supply chains and making more s sustainable sourcing and procurement decisions. They're susceptible to the same thing as some of the small farmers that we're talking about. And in many cases, they may not source directly from small farmers, but may source from a cooperative of small farmers. So their, their supply chains are at risk um, from water shortages and climate change and extreme weather events. And so there's a business case for them. And they see the imperative to strategically prepare for the future and create a more sustainable business and change their model. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily all from consumer and NGO demand, but actually internally changing the way they operate. So speaking of big business versus small business, uh, Shen, as food, founder of FoodX, you fund small startup companies. You, that's your, your, your fund is mission-based. And what you were telling me earlier was that you know, part of your mission, the, the fund's mission, is not to try to make a quick profit. You know, you, you are willing to delay, you know, looking at raise, you know, seeing a return on investment for 10 to 15 years. And that gives you a flexibility to maybe take a chance on, I think I use the word riskier companies, but uh, I, you have a better definition of it. Like, give, give me a, a thumbnail of like how you invest in companies that are trying to do better for the agriculture and the environment and food. Yeah, I mean, I, I know this is a private conversation, so you know my partners <laughs> are not listening. So it's not about profit. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, you're, you're you're right. I mean, it's the the, the secret sauce is very simple. I mean, I, I'll wear my investor hat, which is very it's kind of a, 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 a surreal to me because I come from a strong student movement, social movement background uh, as exile from Tiananmen, and uh, I guess half the room where this is before your time, but uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a Chinese thing. I'm actually a lot older than I look. But, uh, they, they, uh, and then even more recently, you know, as, as a part of uh, the, the media an organization working group in, uh, in Zuccotti Park, it's Occupy, you know, Global Occupy uh, a phenomenal movement. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the main thing, I mean, just to, to address, before I answer specifically Tim's question, just to address you know, our open speaker that, that uh, defined this, uh, this uh, uh, democratizing innovation. Right? I mean, I, for me, it's a matter of uh, bringing the movement mentality into the business innovation aspects of, uh, of this food movement. It's, it's, that's how we, uh, FoodX, and the SS Venture, uh, which is the evergreen fund behind FoodX, that, that, that plan to feed, uh, feed this movement. And, 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 and partly because they, they, they are, are visionaries and the cultural leaders uh, and the NGOs have done tremendous amount of work, events like this, that have uh, uh, not only raised awareness and generated a lot of facts and uh, deep-seated and very solid research, and w which is precursor to this really the groundswell, this, this bottom-up change that uh, the consumers, I mean, our signal is this. The consumers, the eaters and families, they're reading labels. They're finally seriously, they, they may not find what they need to find out, they're still wondering, they're still doing the wrong things, and at least they think they're, do they're not doing the right things, but they're seriously, seriously looking for alternatives. Because before that, I mean, it's, it's not news, you know, I mean, for, for innovators and investors, when you look at a big market, you know, 1.4 trillion is, is kind of an understatement because you know, how, how, where you draw the line, but 1.4 trillion is significant. That's 
food and beverage in this country alone, right? And you look at, you know, you, you know this number. This, this, this is audience that already knows this number that uh, four to eight oranges today equal to one 50 years ago in nutrients, right? And, and each calorie takes 17 calories in Europe. It's about 12 calories to produce and 30 to 45 percent food waste. And generally, you look at globally, right? 25 percent of the population are fed roughly by industrial food system that takes about uh, three quarters, 75 percent of the resource. The reverse is true that the other 75 percent of world population are fed by independent and family farmers that take only use a quarter, uh, 25 percent roughly of the world resource. So you're talking about huge inefficiencies. So when you have that, you have a real business opportunity. And that's where the business engine comes in. So in addition to cultural changes and a lot of policy changes, uh, I think that's another area we, we couldn't work on. We don't want to be awful on 12 things. We want to be good on one thing, right? But in this town, it's, it's worth to mention, I think to that extent, uh, the, the university and, 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 and Danny are doing great work, hopefully, continually to influence that. But even in that area, you have the, the soda tax and all that. But we, 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 that's very encouraging. And in, in, the, in the direct social movement space, when you see the potato workers uh, protest, the fast food uh, workers, I mean, those are real gains, even though they're small, small steps. So, but we believe there's, because of the huge inefficiency and because of this little guys, I mean, the independent, individual consumers and families and innovators and hardworking farmers and entrepreneurs, so, so democratizing that is the business engine aspect is to really empower them to be able to self-determine, right? So that's, that's basically the broad thesis, not the investment thesis. The investment thesis is this. On the macro level, you see that inefficiency, and then you see the, uh, the, the, the consumers. So this is not a representative democracy here. This is a direct democracy because we eat, every one of us eat, right? So you're voting. Every time you eat something, right? So you, you have a real behavior change that calling for uh, an alternative, that's where the opportunity is. And how to realize that? Two very basic things, right? One, the current fund model end up investing only in late stage food companies. So that end up not changing the industry. That's opportunistic. You have really interesting concept, Whole Food and even Starbucks food, I mean, whether you like the product or not. I mean, that's, those are exciting new lifestyle food concepts. But you look at 30 years or longer, right? The industry is not changing. We're, we're getting fatter and hungrier, you know, and, 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 and sicker, right? So, so, so the, the, uh, the, 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 you need a lot longer time frame. And we can afford to do this because we're evergreen fund and we don't have investors. It's our own money, the six, six people partnership. Right, so, so our time horizon is 10 to 15 years. We invest, starting from last year, we invest in, we've made 19 investments now. We invest 20 companies minimum. And then, so with our time horizon, that's 200 up to 500 companies. So we have a portfolio approach, right? Based on that, two things happen, right? One, we're actually uh, investing in the, the, the little guys that actually have a chance to get to a point where a lot of late stage food investment can invest them in with a real alternative, not just another me too or a slight concept change, right? And second thing is that because we have such a vast number uh, that planned, we can invest in uh, triple bottom line companies. Mo you know, Foodex itself, most of our companies, one of them are here DC based, Green East, right, right there, uh, Vanessa. Right? We're, we're, they're, they're, they're benefit, we're benefit corporations. Actually, two of them, I'm proud to say, in the last group of 10 companies that just graduated from a food tech center are actually certified B Corps, right? The reason is not because they, we, we see, oh, they absolutely can do well by doing good. They may or may not. We're investing in two things. One is, these are good teams that understand both sides of the equation that you can do well by doing good. And so, like all good entrepreneurs, they will pivot. They will change to, to something maybe purely nonprofit, maybe something else. But more importantly, is the ecosystem we're investing. We're not food tech. We're not just, we, we made our money in tech, let's apply to food, another gadget, another app. Nothing wrong with that, right? But we're food as a food ecosystem. So, so, so companies like those tri triple bottom line companies are able to provide not just human uh, uh, environment among our founders, but also a functional uh, ecosystem to make our other companies better. In, 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 at, at the end of the day, is this, right? If we know what the true innovation looks like now, it's probably not true innovation. So I have the general trajectory. We have the customers, you know, purely from a business perspective, wanting alternatives. 
we empower the little guys to be able to have access to early stage capital, but multiple stage or early stage capital with, with, with decade or longer uh, 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 time horizon. So something may happen. We're, we're learning more, we're learning as much from our entrepreneurs as our high power mentor network are teaching them. So, so that's basically the formula. Well, so I think you raised an interesting point. Like if you can't know what innovation looks like now, how do you know what companies to, to invest in? Like what are you looking at? What are the criteria for potential companies to invest in now? Yeah, there, there, we have 17 filters. I mean, this gets a, a, a kind of methodical, but the idea is actually simple. You see, it's most bizarre that uh, it's very hard to reconcile doing good, uh, uh, doing well by, by doing good. But in this, there, there, are, there are these times, right? I mean, it's like a perfect storm. There's this moment where usually, usually historical, a major, you know, major historical event, often disastrous historical event that create completely new way of behavior, therefore new set of businesses, right? But this is one of those times, even though we don't have a single event yet, this is one of those times where it converged fairly well. This is one of the, this is about the only movement I've been deeply participated in that is actually a happy, happy movement because I can actually see the finish line because our mission filters, there are five mission filters, and there are t uh, 11 business filters and one about just cohort learning. And, and that they, they actually, after uh, making the, the, the first round of investment, becomes businessly more relevant. So here is a direct answer, right? So we're looking for systemically disruptive ideas. So they're specifically looking at the current industrial food system practices and how to make those systems obsolete. I mean, one example just to, to, I mean, it's actually a smaller example, but the, uh, uh, Tom, I think, from last panel from uh, 4P or, or P4, I mean, that's an idea that we, we you know, it's just one of our investment that is, uh, we call it super CSA, because it transforms CSAs in two ways. One is, is 12 months. So it's not just uh, you change behavior seven months, you go back to the, the modern consumer uh, uh, economy, right? I mean, five months from grocery store. It's 12 months, but it's also produce and proteins and value add, so, so frozen, cured and all that. All of this, I mean, talking about inefficiency, right? I mean, 1,500 miles, we know this, right? 1,500 miles behind each food item in the United States, right? So, so, so Next Organics, this company, Brooklyn based, is sourcing within 100, at most 150 miles, and, and in comparison, some more uh, uh, mature company, like Fresh Direct, so that's 300 miles. So you know the efficiency is there, and with enough time, that's a kind of system when it's 12 months, uh, year, year round, protein and produce and frozen value add product alternative. That's a real full alternative. And, 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 and that kind of idea is it's, it's the stuff we're looking for, not uh, you know, 3D printer uh, for food. And it's great, you know, and a gadget for, you know, we have those companies, I mean, a gadget for a, a sous vide cooker that's a circulator, you know, kitchen, great, right? But that, that's not systemically disrupting, it's in, inspired. So, but it's those kind of somewhat boring from technology perspective, but from, from the food and lifestyle perspective, it's a game changer. Well, one of the real innovators on our panel here is uh, Stone Barnes, and Jill is with Stone Barnes, and, and, and you, you know, f seem to work very grassroots. It's like people come in to Stone Barnes and get to see and experience and smell and, and touch and everything, like what you do. Like, I'm wondering, like, how does that translate into people taking this experience and moving it out into the world? Or does it? Or is it just meant to just be an experience that doesn't have a larger impact in the world? Um, I, think, I think both of those things are true. So we, um, Stone Barnes has a program for general visitors. We sit within 30 miles of 25 million people. So if you want to come there on a weekend and see a farm that's trying to work in harmony with nature and harmony with an ecosystem, you can come kind of look under the hood and see what we're doing. And so for those people, I think really what we're hoping is that they'll come there and have the kind of experience they want to repeat. And they'll start to think about how can they become an active food citizen that supports farming that looks agroecologically sound. Um, <clears throat> but I think equally important is the work that we do with more targeted audiences. And so one of the things that we try to do is create a space for people who have different professional backgrounds and experiences to come together. So a couple examples of that. One is in late December, we had 12 master farmers, so Elliot Coleman, Fred Kirschman, Jack Algier, Cheryl Rogowski, 12 young farmers who are new to industry, 
a lawnmower manufacturer, a wheelchair manufacturer, and a couple seed companies who produce tools for small and small scale agriculture come together to think about tool innovations. So they heard from the farmers, what do you need to make your 30 acre farm, your five acre farm run more efficiently? Um, what kind of tools do you need that are more ergonomic for your body? Um, what kind of tools, what's kind of a price point that you can afford to invest in to realize the efficiency that some of these tools would bring? And they came up with a list of 35 tools that farmers would like to have. And they talked about a couple specific projects. One is a small scale tool carrier that will do many, many things in kind of a market garden sized agricultural landscape. And Johnny's is really interested as they see the small scale farming market taking hold and growing and potentially manufacturing some of these tools. So, and we had the lawnmower person and the wheelchair person and the guy who works on chips in the room because they have engineering backgrounds and could bring existing technologies from other places in the world to bear on agriculture. So we're not inventing things from the beginning, but we really like this idea of bringing kind of strange bedfellows together and being very, very open, but also kind of trying to stimulate that conversation. Um, and another place you see that happen at Stone Barns is kind of the farmer chef scientist relationship. So we're doing lots of projects um, that that try to try to stimulate that. And one that's very interesting is there's a young breeder at Cornell University, Mike Mazurik, who is working closely with Dan Barber, who's an inventive, fabulous chef who has a restaurant at our place, and Jack Alger, who's our farmer, to develop seed varieties that perform very, very well in the Hudson Valley and that taste really, really delicious. And so these three guys just get really, really excited about how can they create kind of the sweetest squash you've ever tasted. And I think they all share the end goal that they want to see people develop a pattern of eating that reflects a more ecologically viable agricultural <coughs> system. Um, so we just, we try to provide, uh, create an environment that that pro different professionals can come together and think about about problems and opportunities <coughs> related to food. <coughs> so, great. Uh, well, let's take some questions <coughs> from the audience. Uh, we've got about 18, 19 minutes left. So, please step up. Yes. <coughs> Hi, Bhavani Jara from IE Green. Um, this is actually for Aaron. Um, I'm surprised that the World Wildlife Fund would partner with a chemical company like DuPont, um, especially when it comes to wild, you know, to farm salmon. Um, you know, my question is, you know, you talk about the proprietary food that they're feeding to the animals. I don't know if any of you ever saw Dan Barber's TEDx talk about, um, f you know, farm raised fish, salmon, and the food that they feed, and the food pellets, you know, and he was trying to dig down and find out what that food was, because it was also proprietary, and I don't know if it was DuPont's or not, but he found out that it was, the protein was from f chicken feed, from chicken scraps, or all the parts of chicken <coughs> that, um, that, you know, people don't eat. You know, and the question is, what happens to the, the nutritional value of fish that's being fed chicken when chicken when fish are not supposed to be eating chicken, um, and so I was just wondering how the World Wildlife Fund feels about trusting a company, a chemical company like Dupont, um, about proprietary ingredients, just like you know, um, proprietary ingredients for fracking or anything. I mean, usually proprietary ingredients are not very good. So um, anyway, that's my question. Sure. So I think that I think that probably <clears throat> the the real issue for us is is about the reduction of impacts, and so what we have is uh, eighty to eighty five percent of fisheries overfished, overexploited, and this is the threat right here. I mean, you can see things dwindling away, and you see a salmon industry that uses about fifty percent of the pelagic fish oils. And, and, and that's driving a lot of this overfishing. So what can we do about it? And what can we do and not be afraid of making some mistakes or, or making some people mad? We, need, we can't stifle the innovation by being scared to take a chance. And I think that what we say is that we've seen a 75% reduction in the amount of wild fish that they depend on. That's something clear. That's conservation. 
And so if there is an opportunity for the yeast that they use to be bad, uh, we, we also recognize that there's certain consumer aspects that have to go through things like FDA testing and pieces like that. But what we were really concerned with is the wild fish. And they created something that took a huge burden off of wild fish. And so we haven't seen many of those types of innovations out there. And so there could be problems. And there's problems with all of these types of systems. There's no perfect system. And so the way that I feel about it is, Let's take some risks. Let's do some things. Let's not be scared to innovate. Let's not look at Facebook and, and Twitter and everything that covers the media, preventing people from taking a chance. But let's just focus on the results. And if we can focus on the results, uh, then it's a, it's a bit more clearly justified in my mind. Yes. I'm going to stay on you with that one. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I know DuPont is uh, doing a lot in their work, and <coughs> like they have several product lines that are cradle to cradle certified and whatnot. Is there not an interest in saying, hey, exactly what are you feeding people? Because that is ultimately going through to us. So can you say proprietary, but do y'all know what's in it? No, what's a yeast? It's a Yaria yeast. And so, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think that, you know, there's aspects of consumer protection. And there's groups that do consumer protection. But we're triaging nature here, right? I mean, we're trying to stop the bleeding. Okay? I mean, we're operating <clears throat> way beyond our capacity. And we need to find solutions. And so we're focused on solutions that produce results. There's results that we see, and they're pertinent. And there's results that may be. And so if we can reduce those clear and present result or impacts and take some chances, I think that we need that. And nothing's going to be perfect. And I think we can't, we can't be scared of everything. And, and maybe I will catch some flack because I said uh, that this innovation is a good idea. But I mean, it's something that we need to come to grips with, that nothing is going to be perfect. We, well, I'll, I'll, st I'll stop there. I'm not saying it's not a good idea. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. What kind of idea it is. Right. Well, and let me follow up, because I think the nature of the first two questions indicates something. There, there's a nervousness about when, when innovators start working with established, entrenched companies. There's a distrust, I think, would be the general sense. How do you make sure you are not being played in this system? Like, you are not, they're not using you as just greenwashing. Like any, any, it's an open question. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, because we can see the production numbers. We have a, a, an aquaculture stewardship council that certifies uh, against these performance metrics. It's not a system approach. It's not a practice approach. It's actual metrics. It's actual efficient fish out ratio that they're third party audited for. And they look back through their supply chain and they know where they get these types of products. Now, the proprietary nature of the piece. Uh, is, is that it's a yeast, but the, but the yeast has gone through FDA approval. But again, I, I, I think that we have our, our own internal structures to prevent greenwashing, and I don't, I, I don't think that we'd allow that. Can I add that? Of course. It's, it's yeah, go to no, Jessica no. first. Um, so, so I will just um, back Aaron up as a fellow nonprofit and NGO trying to create immense change in the food space. Forum for the Future was founded almost 20 years ago by a very prominent UK environmentalist. He is very radical, I can tell you from firsthand experience, named Sir Jonathan Porritt. He was a member of the UK's Green Party, he served on their Sustainable Development Commission, because at the time he saw a gap between people reaching across the table and working with business. There are a lot of very valuable NGOs who campaign and a lot of activists who are putting that pressure on business to change that I alluded to before, and consumers as well, individually, but no one providing um, the support that they needed to create um, tangible solutions. And so organizations like WWF, Forum for the Future, Sustainable Food Lab, um, all now are, are, are reaching across the table, and Forum has been doing it for almost 20 years. Um, Nathaniel Johnson, who's a grist writer in food, I'm sure a lot of us uh, follow him, wrote a piece just last week that said if you change 100 of the biggest food businesses, you change the food system. 
And so that's what we're all trying to do. And we are nonprofits who have our own missions. And so I know from Forum's perspective, we have very strict corporate engagement guidelines when we're starting a new relationship. We work in two-way partnership. So it's, again, about the sustainable value network and making sure that the innovation between us is democratized, where we have a mission to share the results of our experience. We're not consultants. If we were consultants, we get paid a lot better and create a lot less change, <laughs> I promise you. We are not <laughs> consultants, so we are advisors and critical friends to them who, over time, we work in really long-term partnerships with company, companies. We've been working with Unilever almost since our founding. Um, PepsiCo is another long-term partner. And um, that is intentional. And Jonathan had a very controversial piece in The Guardian last week because we dropped two of our um, partners in the energy sector because we didn't feel like our partnership was effective any longer and they were not creating the change that we demanded from them. Um, so that's just form for the future's perspective on how we protect ourselves from that and work with the companies to create change. The, the open speaker framed it really well, right? I mean, this is a recurring uh, 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 question in the, in the food movement of various kinds, of sca scaling up versus scaling out, right? And, 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 and uh, do we become big, right? So, so and, and also, you know, if, if you take the framing a little bit, even uh, from 5,000 uh, uh, foot uh, feet view, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a typical revolution versus evolution. Uh, uh, but, you know, age-old discussions has never have a, a, a definitive answer. I mean, look at the U.S. political landscape. Right? I mean, I mentioned Occupy movement. I mean, there's radical distrust liberals, and then there's a real libertarian distrust Tea Party. I mean, you, you have uh, so so there's always it's, it's, it's run through the the history. There's no definitive answer. But I think with food, there's some perspectives. Right? One is. Uh, uh, well, you know, we started food accent calling for a food revolution, and very quickly we changed the thesis, not because we don't want to offend anyone. It's because we realized, one, this is a direct democracy, right? We vote every time we eat, right? So, so it's not a representative democracy. It's a little bit more uh, effective. There's a business case when the voters, in this case eaters, you know, like we, we all see that. It's a good business case over the long run to source sustainably to provide this, this alternative. So, some evolution, I would personally argue, very radical evolution is possible, but personally, I think usually you, you make the other system obsolete. You know, so 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 it's it's never an easy decision. You know, for for my companies, for our companies, right? Mm -hmm. Do they do they sell, right? I mean, we have Ben Cole and Ben Jerry. I mean, it's famously uh, so Ben and Jerry to Unilever. I mean, what do you is that? Unilever, how, how, how much Ben Jerry revenue total as a percentage of the largest ice cream provider of the world? And what, 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 is, what is the poll, what is the push, what, what, how much you affect? So, so the, the unique, so we, we don't have a fixed answer to that. And, it's, and because the way we invest, we always take small equity, so it's their company. So they, they will make that decision, right? They, they will sell, they will, they, will, they will go big, they will, uh, they will go IPO, and then you face all kinds of different market issues, and then you make those decisions along the way as a good entrepreneur. Do you do well by always doing good, or, or you cut some corners, right? So we can resolve that question. But what we do here, uh, in, in, at least in the FoodEx world, is this, we remind them, and this is generally true about what I've observed as a food, food movement in general, in that, which, I'm, which we are and I am part of, is that, there is a tendency, and it's very understandable tendency, but it's absolutely not necessary, it's self-defeating. That is to avoid, that to have ideological purity, to mm -hmm. avoid to work with the, the, the big evil empires, right? To, 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 to even uh, frown at capital and, 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 and to, 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 to reject the con concepts of big, right? Uh, is there a happy, happy medium? Yes, the good news is this, yes, right? Because there, sometimes scaling up is scaling up. I mean, I'll give you two, two set quickly uh, examples. Right? I mean, one, again, from a, from, from a movement background, you look at Tiananmen Square, when we have 150 million people on the street for an extended period of time, right? I mean, that's all, ground, that's all bottom up, right? I mean, it's the same thing with radical movement, like Occupy movement globally, right? But you look at the IT world, there's a tried and true, very established example. So when you look at companies like eBay, right? I mean, they, they enable a lot of little guys and bypass and it makes other model, if not obsolete, at least it's a real compelling alternative and employ like a third of a million of, 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 uh, of sellers and, and, and buyers. So, I mean, so there are those models that scale up while they scale up. You know, so that's, that's our job to, to remind our entrepreneurs, our companies that there are those alternatives and ideally you want to go for that alternative first. You know. All right. I think we've hit the evil empire question pretty well. Um, <laughs> other questions? Yes. Yes. Here. 
Um, my name is Amber Breidenberg. Um, I'm from 4P Foods. Um, the question I had is just a thought that came into my mind, and that humanity is very set on progress, and in that progress, uh, often we've, we're moving forward, um, innovating to something new, but often that also um, forces us to, to turn away from some of the more traditional things that prove to be more sustainable uh, and long-lasting. Um, so do you see or the potential that in the future in innovation there is room for traditional practices and looking back? I, I don't know, I, and this, this may be kind of bucking the system a bit, but the traditional practice, say, for shrimp farming in Southeast Asia is to cut down mangroves, dig ponds there, and let the water flow in and out of those ponds. Um, really large damage. Uh, if you were to look uh, at the coastlines of, uh, in the Gulf of Thailand, in Thailand, uh, Kamau and the tip of Vietnam, Sumatra, in the Strait of Malacca, Nening, Guangzhou, these areas uh, have been decimated and a lot of it has been done by small scale production. Now maybe that's feeding into a larger industrial design of an aggregator and a large buyer, but a lot of this was done by small scale producers. And further, I think that we've heard a lot about sustainability um, from an organic perspective, uh, but if you were to do the calculations of low intensity farming for, let's just say, the US demand for farm shrimp in Thailand, you would need 50 times more land converted to, uh, to shrimp ponds, and that's coastal land. Now, if these are problems with certain standards, that's, that's one thing, but I think that we need to understand that there are trade-offs and that some of the conventions are really uh, land intensive, um, at least as far as aquaculture goes, uh, and there are impacts of that. And then there's great impacts also with uh, more intensive systems and greater nutrients and greenhouse gases. So I guess that's what I was trying to say is that these things, there's no silver bullet, I, I, don't, I don't think. Um, but there may be some conventional wisdom and conventional practices that have worked for a long time and that have sustained themselves for a long time uh, that are better than others. And I, and I probably would let some of the others speak. I have that. a quick answer. If you replace the word tradition with nature, then our formula is simple. The reason we're not food tech is because we believe to restore good agriculture, therefore a good system, is to actually 90% of it to go back to nature, of respecting nature. If that involves tradition, great, and often they do. If modern technology and the future technology help us to get there, great, you know, we, we shouldn't be ideologically pure to you know, go back to paleo diet or something. There's nothing wrong with it, by the way. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, 10% is uh, forward-looking. So I mean, for us, if I have to put a percentage on it and swap your question with nature, 90% is going back to nature. Because we lost our way by not respecting it. Let's go to Doug first. He's been waiting patiently, then we'll go to Steve. Well, ju just to say, I mean, traditional practices or, or practices within the last recent decades of small cap produ producers aren't automatically beneficial. There's a lot, of, a lot of pressures on them. But we can't discount the real knowledge there, and it is, it is being discounted in, in, in many sectors. I've I got to go back to the evil empire real, go real, evil empire. real briefly. <laughs> it's a big I, 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 and I, so I'm not going to criticize uh, Project Unilever or, or DuPont, just to note that they are part of, for example, the G8 New Alliance in Africa. And there is a real question of power in the food system. And these companies are expanding their power in Africa and their control over resources. Um, they're not necessarily buying land directly, but they're, they're in, you know, they may be in relationships with people who are acquiring land. And, um, and so, um, you know, the bottom line is, is there there's needs to be a role, um, there's a lot of talk about public-private partnerships, but in many cases, and there is a very important role for private capital and private companies, I don't deny that, but the public sector really does need to take its, its, its proper place and, and there needs to be democratic processes in which, in which small producers are influencing that private sector. And to go back to our keynote speaker, he talked about the food hubs here in the U.S. I mean, we would love to see USAID and, and USDA promoting food hubs in, in Africa uh, instead of some of the, you know, the more asymmetrical relationships that are being promoted. We have about two more minutes left, Steve. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, when we talk about these agroecological learner, learning processes, you know, farmers, of course, are innovators, and it's a constant process of innovation. So, as was mentioned, you know, some practices like slash and burn are traditional but are not sustainable, not agroecological, and there is a need to increase production. So, 
that's part of the whole dynamic of supporting processes with farmers organizations and women's organizations where they can continue to evolve, improve, but on their own terms as actors who are uh, uh, you know, given power in the system to uh, engage in this process, generate uh, alternatives, and try to scale those and try to connect to markets, but you know, as people that aren't marginalized but have a real voice in the system as democratic actors. Yeah. You know, we're, at, at Stonemarge, we're having conversations every day with farmers who are doing things particularly around soil, so it's the year of soil. They're looking back at Sir Albert Howard. They're looking at these old-style European crop rotations to try to replenish their soils and make them more nutrient-rich and manage them. So, um, you know, I think it's, I, I, heard, I go back to what Shen said, which is it's marrying kind of technology in some cases, but also like looking back to biological sciences that have been effective methods of farming for hundreds of years and really trying to, to learn from that, that knowledge base that already exists. Let's take one more question. It's gotta be the question from the gods. Who's got the best question out there? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was probably too big of a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yes, gentleman down here, front row. Oh wait, we already had one, sorry. Let's go up here. I don't wanna usurp God, sorry. Um, my name is Melissa Terry, I'm a food policy graduate student at the University of Arkansas. And my question is for um, the innovation and the entrepreneurship practitioners and um, accountably engaging with the evil empire or with big business and the public-private sector partnerships the question is, um, how effective do you think um, brokers like the Sustainability Consortium are in scorecards and key performance indicators that, that can be third party, um, keep third party accounting of the relationships like that you have talked about? Is that for me? Okay. So the question is, how, how effective is the things like are this? You using No, so we don't use third-party verifiers, but right. when businesses have um, metrics or measurements of the way that they do their operations, they engage with companies who are third-party certifiers who often charge a lot of money and are consultants. So we don't use them to monitor our relationships, um, but we think that our own um, self-monitoring and, and our own moral values are, are quite strong. So, I mean, we are a group of vegetarian bike riding. We work in an old industrial building in a lovely part of Brooklyn called Gowanus. Um, so we, we are you, I am you. I used to be a volunteer farmer at Stone Barns. Um, and so we, we don't pay other companies to verify the work we do. Right, I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't questioning you personally or organization. I was just wondering about the effectiveness of these kinds of programs for the private sector as a tool for you. So, of course, that's what so the bottom line is, right? right? Yeah. So that that's up to them to measure the impact of the things that they then implement. So we kind of set them on their way and help them set a strategy and real goals that they can implement. Um, but then we are not in the company to then implement them, and that's why we work in long-term partnership because then we check in and find out how the program's going, any new, um, any new challenges. Um, that we can help with. So, sorry if I didn't answer. Maybe Aaron. They've been invaluable for WWF. I mean, we look to an ICL Alliance accredited uh, standard setting process. Uh, so, you're already talking about setting standards that are already accredited. Uh, and then we look for a third party independent certifier uh, and like the Marine Stewardship Council, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. Um, this is our effort at democratization. I mean, we can't go out there and be with every farm. We need others to do the work for us. We can try to initiate some of these things, but our effort is to use the market to try to leverage more of it. So I, I think that those are invaluable tools to uh, at least the environmental community. Great. Thank you very much. Very, very uh, entertaining and intriguing session. Thank you. Thank you very much.